Welcome to another dimension. A dimension of insight. A dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. And a lot of conversations that we do on this show arrive at my doorstep, sometimes in very cryptic fashion. My guest for this show tonight does what a lot of guests do. He dangles a little bit of red meat in front of me and watches me snap like a Doberman. And uh, <laughs> Doc, you sent me this quote from John Fort, which is, you know, that's one of the basic food groups here. I believe that mankind is a bit property. And yes. you also um, hinted that you have some angles to explore on UFO, UFO stealth technology. So we oh, got wow. you on tonight to talk about this and, and re maybe revisit a little bit of the last show that we did, which was back in August of 2013 with Chris Holly, when we talked about um, the Dulce Mysteries. So to yes. my listeners out there, I want to uh, once again present and introduce, if this is the first time you've heard him, Doc Vega, the website is docvega.com, and he is very much an explorer of alternative realities. Doc, welcome. Thank you very much, man. You know, we were talking off mic before um, we began the recording, uh, but uh, we were talking about Dulcie and about uh, this, this thread into our history, our past, our civilization that... I don't think we've completely sorted out yet. And when when the John Ford you know, you know there are, you know there are several dynamics, you know, there are several several dimensions that were, you know that uh, corroborate, you know, the existence with Dulce that are beyond just trying to document history and whether or not there were aliens, you know, that that predated mankind or coexisted with us in history and Suddenly, there was a secret facility stumbled upon by U.S. expeditionary forces, you know, in New Mexico in 1940. There seems to be something very insidious going on where people reporting on this phenomena are being victimized by, who knows, I mean, government, you know, counterintelligence, or I know that Anthony Sanchez suffered greatly after, you know, he released the book uh, UFO Highway, and you and I were talking about that, Randy, and yeah, then... Yeah. Here I am, I go through an untimely divorce that doesn't make any sense at all, you know, to me, and it seems to exactly correlate to a series of articles that I wrote about, you know, UFO Highway on UFODigest.com, uh, you know, an eight, you know, article series and, you know, and, and a lot of in-depth, uh, detailed coverage, you know, of the book, you know, and, and other things, of course, you know, that I've researched myself. Yeah, and talk a little bit about that that series as well, Doc. What what you kind of mapped out there? See, the Dulcie based thing just keeps coming up in conversations, and it seems to wrap itself around the core of ufology. So, uh, you know, when we talk about this, we're talking about some pretty core material. Well, I mean, we're talking about you know things that the involvement of the U.S. government in a super secret project that predates even World War II in 1940, where there was an expeditionary force that was sent out to basically scope out a secret location for the Manhattan Project in terms of weaponizing the results that they, you know, had already established, you know, in that secret operation facility that was underneath that stadium in Chicago. Now they wanted to move it you know, to, you know, somewhere in, in, the, in the reclusive, you know, uh, outreach of the American Southwest. And, you know, so basically they would have even more, you know, secrecy or, or more, you know, uh, uh, you know, insulation from any, you know, public disclosure. And so they stumble upon a series of underground caverns in the Archelita Mesa. And much to their... Uh, you know, I mean, amazement, they go into a corridor and they find these flat screens against the walls. They find objects that they thought were German technology, which basically from the description sounds like modern day 
laptops, flat screens, and yet they did not even know they were being monitored as they made their way down these uh, uh, these mysterious corridors, you know, that were incredibly well engineered. You know, in other words, like these weren't just caverns. They apparently had been engineered, you know, artificially, okay? And then they found evidence that there had been a battle between Indians and non-terrestrial beings, and there were still corpses there. Gun blasts against the walls, arrows, um, you know, wrecked machinery. Apparently the Indians had gone in and using Winchesters and, and, you know, arrows and handguns had taken on the aliens that they had, you know, stumbled upon down there. And God only knows, you know, how, you know, Indians are able to explore their terrain and, and all the intricacies of, of caverns and everything. And, you know, I guess it would have been a given that sooner or later they, you know, they would have been, they would have discovered, you know, this secret facility that maybe the aliens had thought was impervious to discovery. You can reference oh. the, uh, we can reference the 2011 Steven Spielberg movie, Cowboys and Aliens, which is loosely based on that that whole narrative you just m- mapped out there. Yeah, it seems to, to you know, I mean, uh, uh, he, you know, like basically hypothesizes a fictional account, you know, so, you know, we're putting it in that circa. But when you take a look at an underground facility in New Mexico that has several, you know, lower levels, you know, that are all distinctly engineered, you know, according to some type of technology that didn't even exist, you know, in the the 1800s, you know, when the Indians stumbled upon it. And we're talking about flat screen technology and and, uh, computers and you know, dead alien and Indian bodies, you know, that, you know, had, and, and the recovery of artifacts such as, you know, uh, you know, Indian, you know, relics and, and, uh, I mean, 45 caliber handguns and Winchester rifles and O. Henry rifles that, I mean, were in mint condition, you know, when the, uh, when the U S army military expedition discovered all of this and began recovering it and began removing it from the caverns and, uh, containerizing it and categorizing and labeling it and everything. Um, it's just amazing. It's an amazing piece of uh, archaeological work. So we we just, and I just finally found what I was looking for earlier. Uh, the name Phil Schneider ring a bell to you? Yes, yes. Okay, so Phil Schneider um, basically... Uh, now, here's a tragic hero is Phil Schneider. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about Phil Schneider. Well, Phil was uh, a geophysical engineer that was contracted by the U.S. government uh, in a basically classified capacity. Uh, It was his job to to go down and analyze rock strata through these boreholes that they would, you know, that they would explore with. And and the exploration was basically for the purpose of determining what type of detonation or explosive charges would be needed, you know, to be most effective against the different layers of sedimentary and, you know, metamorphic, you know, rock they would travel through and even, you know, they would even run into, you know, magma uh, as they went further down and there's even magma on the surface, you know, in in areas of of, uh, New Mexico, uh, solidified magma, which is like lava rock, but Anyway, so it was his job to analyze, you know, the the strata, you know, and they would lower him down, you know, uh, via bucket, you know, into uh, these poles that they would drill. And then, you know, basically he would do uh, like uh, findings and and produce data for them. And then, you know, based upon that, you know, they would proceed further. But on this one fateful day that he went down, uh, they stumbled once again upon a subterranean uh, existence of, of hostile aliens, and their involved was a firefight, you know, where Green Beret and uh, Black Ops troops, and we're talking about, like, you know, exceptionally well-trained special operations forces, you know, uh, engaged 
uh, an alien subterranean force that was well equipped. And these aliens had learned, you know, from uh, their prior encounter that they had had with the U.S. military in 1940 when uh, at Archelita Mesa they had engaged in a firefight and got their butts kicked. Because, you know, these were not, you know, Indians with 45 caliber handguns and spears and, you know, O. Henry rifles. We were talking about, you know, uh, World War II vintage soldiers who had 50 caliber, uh, you know, Thompson machine guns and M1 rifles and grenades. And uh, the aliens got the worst of that, you know, firefight. Well, they learned, you know, from that engagement. And uh, when Phil had been lowered down uh, via bucket into that borehole and several hundred feet under, he was he found himself in the midst of a firefight, and he pulled a handgun that he had from his, I believe it was a radiation suit because, or some type of a, a special suit that was designed uh, because there had been smoke that was pouring out of this uh, tunnel that he was lowered into, and they're wondering, what the hell is this, you know, about? You know, what's causing this? So they lowered him down there, and they were trying to find out, you know, what was causing this, and, and why were they encountering it? Because their readings, you know, were not consistent, you know, with, with a scenario like this. So he goes down there, draws his gun, shoots one alien and kills it immediately. Uh, I think he claims that he shot another one, and then suddenly there was a, an alien entity that merely waved its hand in front of itself, and he said that he was hit with something like a bolt of lightning that struck him in the stomach, sheared off two of his fingers, and fried one of his legs to a crisp. And, uh, you know, his lower leg, I think, you know, from uh, the upper, you know, uh, below the, the knee down to his foot. And he collapsed and basically uh, fit was going to die. He was, you know, I, I, I mean, he was pretty well, you know, convinced he was going to die. Yet a Green Beret soldier jumped into the bucket, uh, hit the controls for and uh, one thing that Schneider mentioned in a talk, I believe, and it was in 1996 when he was addressing an audience, he said that that's one thing he remembered and regretted was that that soldier had died saving his life. Uh, because once he got to the surface, he, he got emergency medical help. But uh, according to Phil, uh, the firefight did not go well for U.S. forces, um, uh, and they took on a lot of casualties. And uh, when I was in the uh, US UFO uh, crash retrieval conference that went on for several years in Las Vegas, given by uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Wood and, and uh, Ryan Wood, his son, uh, they had said that during the course of the firefights that the special ops forces were instructed to go for the head of the aliens because they had some kind of body armor that could deflect uh, bullets. So they were instructed to shoot for the head. And maybe this is what these guys in 1979 didn't know and what cost them so dearly in the course of the firefight that they engaged with the aliens in. Yeah, I think the conjecture with these particular aliens is that they are... Um, yes. They basically have an exoskeletal system that pretty much protects the inner inner organs from any damage. Uh, yeah, Um According to Anthony Sanchez in his book, UFO Highway, they, okay, they had evolved in another star system. When they came here to Earth, they found that uh, the atmosphere and the conditions here were not as favorable to them as Mars, where they originally came from. Mm -hmm. But there was supposed, supposedly a catastrophe that occurred with the collision of a comet or a, or a huge asteroid. And then they evacuated to Earth and found that, uh, you know, they could not last very long out, you know, exposed to the intense sunlight that we have here compared to right, Mars. Right. Yeah. And they were forced to, to live underground. And their chemistry uh, and their biology is of such that they can live in circumstances that would be toxic to human beings. And they, they can live amongst uh, noxious fumes and soot that would kill a human being. And that's what they were doing down there in that hole, you know, that uh, that Phil had descended into. 
uh, and then, you know, you know, been part of an engaged firefight, you know, with these uh, entities. And so, F- Phil Schneider, you know, this is, I guess, not a f- so much a footnote in history of ufology, but sadly, uh, a cautionary tale that Phil Schneider w- did go public. He began revealing what he knew he did. I don't know how many talks he wound up doing, but he wound up dying under very mysterious and violent circumstances. Well, this is the strange deal, okay? Now... His body had been found dead for two weeks in his apartment. He was he had gone through a divorce with his wife. I don't know that the divorce was really that hostile or, you know, between the two of them because the wife uh, apparently still cared about him and he loved his, his son very much. But the investigators had one story and the wife had a second story about the condition of the body that, that was that they found Yes. Uh, still in, and they tried to attribute natural causes to his death, the official version, okay? Yet the wife said that it looked like he had been strangled with a piano wire yeah. and murdered with extreme prejudice. And, you know, that kind of makes sense, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the way to get rid of a whistleblower that is about to divulge a major classified leak, you know, to the public. And, um, We've seen examples of this before, and always there's a question, you know, because of counterintelligence and in and, and the media, always backing down, you know, and, and not telling the truth like they're doing today, you know, massively. But, um, you know, this is a really uh, sad commentary, you know, over a subject that, you know, is, lives in mystery, and to this very day, you know, we're, we're having trouble trying to uncloud all the issues. Well, there's almost like this weird omen that hangs over this area of ufology in particular but as you and i have talked about as well there's a price that's paid by people who come out who are whistleblowers who have uh first-hand knowledge and people who are attempting to uh, document and write about these ongoing things i mean dulcie the knowledge about dulcie goes back now um almost 30 years really almost 40 at years. least in 1985 from yeah. what i understand according you know norio pretty well you know he pretty well documented you know the very first of it you know and uh so yeah you're you're right uh, Randy, it's it's close to 30 years now. But it, it, the, the disclosure has come very slowly, and it's done at an expense because of the cognitive dissonance of the, the general public. The fact that you right. and I have to cordon off certain parts of our life in order to have discussions about this particular type of subject matter is in itself telling. It's not dinner conversation by any means. No, and uh, at least not, you know, with the end so of uh, you know NSA revelations, you know, you know, this may not be anything that you and I can easily separate, you know, from our normal lives anyway. Well, and here's the thing: it is going mainstream, but it's it's gone very slowly. The culture itself is in this very rapid shift right now. So, in, in a sense, people like you and uh, Norio who was an early interview on this show, by the way. Norio, I I think, was my second or third interview when I started off playing at radio. Um, Yeah, he's fantastic. Are people that stuck your necks out a long time ago. I mean, Norio was out there chasing uh, UFOs in in, in the 1970s. Well, I know, and and you're talking about, you know, he was out there in Area 51. He was out there, you know, uh, spending a lot of time, uh, you know, around the Archelita Mesa. And God only knows, I mean, these these are real, real sensitive, uh, you know, uh, government installations. And I'll tell you something that that I heard not only from Norio, but the local Indians, you know, because I was going to interview a number of them is that you cannot get a high-definition electronic camera to take a picture of the Archelita Mesa. You need to have a mechanical film camera, you know, old-style analog, you know, camera, you know, to, to, to take pictures because there is literally an electronic field that will, I mean, encrypt, you know, the image of the region. So we could That's have... That's pretty amazing. Have... I mean, if, no, if there's nothing to all of this, and it's all a bunch of bunk... And it's just a bunch of conspiracy theories like Randy and Doc Vega, you know, and it means absolutely nothing at all. Then why is such an effort being made, you know, to 
conceal this zone of uncertainty, you know, that, that seems to draw so many of us to it. And unfortunately, some of us, you know, under very, uh, you know, costly circumstances. Well, I don't know why you do what you do. I mean, I, I do this because, frankly, I know what's out there. I've known this since I was a kid. I've seen the craft. I've had contact with the beings. I, so have I. I know. You know what? I'm, you know as well as I do, because when I was a kid, you know, about eight years old in L.A., same deal, man. Yeah. yeah. And see, there was a time when you would have been committed to a mental institution for this. You would have been you would have been drugged you would have been certified and it was like i said not something that got discussed and especially not when you're a little kid um you weren't believed but to continue through life insisting no there really are craft no there really are aliens out there and yes i've seen them i know they exist that is still considered to be an insane conversation and you know that doc Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I can't go and discuss that with people I've done business with in a comfortable manner or, yeah, it, it's not the manner of, uh, you know, uh, coffee tabletop conversation with, you know, uh, with people that you don't know well, like acquaintances, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll immediately get labeled. You know, I'll never forget one time I went out on a date one time with an Addison, Texas uh, police you know, a woman, um, yeah, I was single at the time and, uh, had gone through a divorce. And so we sat down at a restaurant, you know, and we were having a, a couple of drinks and dinner uh -huh. and I mentioned something about UFOs offhandedly and she just gave me the weirdest look. And I said, uh, well, <laughs> I guess I put myself, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the province of, uh, uh you know, of, uh, Cookville with that statement, didn't I? And she said, no, you didn't. She said, uh, I have a friend who is an airline captain, and she said, there is a secret society of airline captains across the U.S. who privately document their UFO sightings because they cannot go to her and report this stuff, and, they, and they're afraid to go to the FAA you know, or to the air traffic controllers and admit what they're seeing because they know that it can have a drastic effect on their career. So what they do is they, they exchange notes, they maintain correspondence, and even a, a few flight attendants, you know, that are privy to this information, share it too. And I thought, wow, you know, I mean, all this is going on, you know, and the general public is either unaware, the media doesn't care to explore it. And of course, I mean, we, we just have a government-controlled, you know, media, and, um, uh, this issue, I mean, this, this saga, this, this strange mystery just perpetuates itself. Well, but uh, the converse side of that, too, Doc, is by coming out and doing what we're doing, we are, in a way, allowing other people to begin their own disclosure process. I was at um, an energy conference out in Boulder, Colorado last October, and the last night I was there, I had somebody take me up to their room and begin to show me pictures on their laptop of, uh, well, let's just say aliens from uh, the Scandinavian countries and uh, Holland. And a uh, long conversation went deep into the night and early morning. Uh, a bunch of people sitting around in a hotel room discussing uh, their experiences and their knowledge about UFOs and extraterrestrials. And so we're, we're raising the comfort level for disclosures right now by, by being public about this. It, it, I, I think the tide's turned a little bit in that sense. Yes, I agree with you, Randy. I agree with you. I think, you know, slowly but surely the tide is turning. Unfortunately, you know, we have a new generation of, uh, of kids, millennials, that are growing up who have been indoctrinated, you know, and they're adopting that same type of denial. Oh, yeah, I see that. You know, yes. I mean, some of them are waking up and they're seeing, you know, that, that, that there's, you know, we're entering into a totalitarian uh, era, you know, in our society, you know, thanks to government. But some of them are actually waking up and seeing, you know, that there's, you know, there is a violation of the First Amendment right going on and that uh, we're not as free to exchange, you know, ideas and, and whistleblowers definitely are a target, you know, by the federal government for on all levels, not just UFOs. So, uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're in, a, in, in that era that you mentioned, you know, on your on your quote, you know, where 
absolutes exist no more. You know, we don't have absolute truth anymore. Well, we're st- and we're still seeing the suppression. I don't know. Uh, it, it almost pains me to bring this up. Um, Stan Romanek. Um, I don't know if you've heard about Stan Romanek, yeah. mm-hmm. but unfortunately, Stan was arrested because it was they discovered uh, so-called child pornography on his computers. And I know Stan Romanek. I, I, I spent some time talking with him. I interviewed him. I know his story inside out, and it's not consistent with the character of the man at all. And mm-hmm. I'm a pretty good judge of character on that kind of thing intuitively it feels like a setup it feels like somebody just went down again and that seems to be the man i mean dude they they can set anybody up they want to you know what i'm saying stan in my interview and on interviews he's done before and since said you know they constantly screwed with his computers he'd have images and the images would be disappeared off of his hard drives his computers mm-hmm. would be scrambled there was all kinds of electronic interference and surveillance that was going on constantly with stan and you have to consider the fact that somebody like that i mean stan gave remarkable material uh certainly not based on his own intellectual ability. The guy was a dyslexic with barely a ninth grade education. Basically, he was a retail clerk. And yet he provided mathematical formulas that physicists and mathematicians are still puzzling over. How do you explain that? Stan got extremely emotional in the interview that I did with him about the, the, the children that showed up a couple times at his property because he was convinced that they were part of him, that he was part of a hybridization program. Now, on the surface, all of that sounds totally insane, but anybody that spent time in this in this realm knows there's a great deal of truth to this, especially after interviewing abductees. You know, I think Whitley Stryber did a great job, even though uh, many, you know, uh, and even including Rush Limbaugh, have uh, alleged that uh, that Communion, the movie, and his book uh, were actually social experiments, just like. Uh, the fires, um, the fireside theater presentation of uh, Orson Welles' uh, yeah. War of the Worlds, nineteen thirty-eight, where the authorities are trying to establish if you introduce a basic shock into society that disturbs belief systems, inherent belief systems, you know, that that hold all of us together, you know, as human beings in, in the same society, in the same civilized, you know, commonly held belief systems. What happens? What happens when you dissolve, you know, those uh, sacredly held beliefs? Um, We've already seen it with, uh, you know, a man flying aircraft over reclusive islands in the Pacific where ancient primitive people begin worshiping aircraft as being gods. Cargo cult, because what basically. happens is it, it eclipses their own belief system. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, we're, we're seeing this now, you know, with the introduction of, of you know, UFO uh, experiences, sightings, abductions. Um, we're seeing, you know, a, almost an attack, you know, on our sacredly held beliefs. Well, there's this old analogy, and I forget who coined it, but... It was said that um, back in the days when the um, early adventurers were going around the world on ships, they would come up on the shorelines, but the natives would not see the ships. And they would actually then eventually consult the shaman, and the shaman would see the ships. But they themselves didn't see it. It would be the shaman that pointed out to them this anomalous object on the, on the skyline. And wow. I, that's that. That's a powerful analogy to the culture, because I've seen UFOs, and yet people around me didn't see them. And, right. Um, it requires a certain amount of strength in your own sanity to have that happen to you, and to have it happen several times. But yet, I had a, a couple of sightings where I had witnesses with me. And in one case, that person will never confirm what happened that night. But in fact, I had a living witness. And so 
in a sense, you know, it's true. Some people, through complete denial or inability to accept anything but what their mind filters as accepted reality, they cannot accept anything else but the reality that they have chosen, you know, to filter or, or to interpret for their own sake of consciousness. Well, this is the nature of our consciousness. Our consciousness isn't itself. You know, people talk about consciousness all the time. Um, consciousness is like the filter on a camera. It's designed to limit the amount of information coming in. And it is an evolving, shifting, and expanding operating system in human biology right now. Because it is shifting. But if you can imagine that these things have been in the skies for probably tens of thousands of years, I mean, they're... De they're depicted in, in, in sacred art coming out of the Renaissance period. You have those weird pictures of Jesus. Isn't there, isn't there a strange uh, image of a, of a uh, disc with two men standing on it uh, right behind the Mona Lisa? Yeah. See, we've in had the corner this, of the sky, and you're wondering, what the hell would the artist put that there for, you know? Well, and then you go back into Egyptian history, and you have these really strange giant beings holding little tiny humans in their hands as part of these boss reliefs in Egyptian art. And you have the legends of the Anunnaki, the legends of the Nephilim, the legends of the Archons. And we have our, we have lived in a culturally conditioned filter system that has basically switched off our ability to recognize, hence cognit cognitively uh, see what is going on around us. You know, Randy, we are living through decades, if not centuries, of government-sanctioned social engineering that basically establishes for us what the norm should be. So people begin because they're, they believe that government is all-seeing and altruistic and has all the answers, that they're supposed to ascribe to everything told to them by the government. But what they don't realize is, is the government has its own agenda and that the government only wants you to see what it wants you to see, not the big picture and not what really ultimately is going on in the bigger reality, the big picture. And that actually brings us right back into, I believe that mankind is but property, the famous term yes. by John Fort. Uh, that that, that no comes doubt. from the Book of the Damned. Is That's the book that he, he's most famous for, is the Book of the Damned. Yes. So yes. talk a little bit. He had a, he had a, he had a, uh, a predecessor, uh, a Swedenborg, yes. who um, was maybe even more, how should I say, visionary than Fort. Fort was an incredible archivesman, Okay. He did an incredible job of archiving so many, you know, inexplicable events. But people like Swedenborg experienced things that were supernatural and that, you know, I mean, just absolutely contradicted, you know, what most of us think of as normal reality. Uh, he talked about a, 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 a incident in his life where he was walking across a field and this was this was uh, discussed in John Keel's book, Operation Trojan Horse, where he encountered an, an entity that seemed to be out of thin air, yet it was solid. And he forced himself with all of his fear and his courage to pass through the entity. He knew he was encountering something solid, and he felt it actually pass through his body. Uh, and he was going one direction and it was going in another direction, but he, d he didn't know if it was put there as an obstacle to stop him. But Swedenborg was, I mean, you know, a very, very, you know, spiritual and philosophical figure indeed in his time, you know, and we're talking 17th century. Uh, and, you know, he easily, you know, could have been, you know, put, you know, put to the gallows or, or, or you know, met similar ends, you know, with, um, you know, an intolerant, you know, society that existed at the time that could have considered him to be a wizard, a warlock, a witch. So he had a lot of courage, you know, to, you know, to be able to espouse, you know, those uh, controversial experiences. And yet, you know, it appears as though 
um, in every generation, there are those among us that somehow have the grace to 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 be able to speak these things into the culture. And you know, you were talking about Swedenborg and 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 John Keel, and yet I I, I can never forget a, another early interview I did with Bob Dean, and Bob Dean says just flat out, he goes, Randy, I'm telling you, the aliens walk among us. They look like us to a large degree. He said, you could sit on an aircraft beside one. And he said, unless you've got a trained eye, you might not know what you're dealing with. He also told me that they walked the halls of the Pentagon. You know what? I, my mind goes back to that TV show years ago. And Randy, I don't know if you remember, it was called The Invaders. Oh, with, yes. With Roy Finnis. Roy Finnis. Yep. Oh, my God, that was an incredible series. And, and how they, they actually took some historical, you know, UFO sightings and implemented them into the script of the show. And the only way that you could actually tell an alien who had been converted to human appearance was the crooked forefinger, you know. And, and here was this poor guy, you know, trying to convince people what was going on, that there was on a planetary scale that we were being infiltrated by human appearing entities from another world you know and and you know here he is just an architect that everybody thinks is crazy i thought that show was brilliant see in the 60s especially you had this window of time and and there's one man that we can thank for all of that and that's rod serling because he was the yep. master at it but in uh some of these early tv shows and, and i would include time tunnel in that as well we mm -hmm. had for a short period of time, what I would call like a, a micro disclosure in the form of fiction. Yes. Uh, perhaps even an insight into a technology that had been secretly achieved already and, you know, was basically, you know, being withheld from the, from the, uh, from the general public, you know, uh, through defense contractor secrecy and, and classified projects uh, generated by the federal government. Sure. And, and now we've heard, over the years, people that have come out of these projects. Um, I, I've talked extensively with my friend Duncan O'Finian about these matters because Duncan has his own take on um, both time travel and, and excursions to Mars. And then Andrew Basciago, the attorney from Washington State, who was um, said to be part of Project Pegasus, and what they were doing jump room activity in the late 60s late 60s and early 70s so mm -hmm. you know w in a lot of ways the people who have asked for disclosure don't realize how much information we've been given albeit a lot of it has been very veiled well i mean take a look at i mean the wealth of information we've got from you know, the FBI opened up their vault in 19, in uh, December 2010 or 11. I, I'm trying to, I think it's 11. Yes. And by the way, and is, uh, they, that is posted up on my website as a PDF permanently. Yes. Archived. And I mean, it is a brilliant source of historic investigations that show what chaos existed in the late 1940s forward where uh, J. Edgar Hoover is fighting the federal government and fighting the armed forces trying to get, you know, to the source of the evidence that they have. And yet the armed forces and the federal government are using the FBI as an investigative branch, but denying the FBI the same source of evidence that they themselves have. It's just incredible. And, uh, you know, people don't realize that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover and his, his special agents were intimately involved, you know, in a number of UFO investigations that were just, I mean, they were crucial. And, uh, you know, we have this wealth of information that you're talking about that begins from that period forward. And yet, somehow we're led to believe that all of it's bunk. Somehow it's dismissible. Uh, it was all, you know, Project Mogul. Uh, it was a weather balloon. It's not, you know, let's just go ahead and, and dismiss it. always my favorite. The fog of time, you know, and the fog of time has nothing to do with the facts. Yeah, I mean, look, they they went through dis they went through disclosure and debunking themselves at the same time. You look at Project Blue Book, 
and what came out of that. And yet at the same period, you had in the background Majestic 12, which was the group yeah. that basically would have been um, the inner circle advisors to Truman and Rose, uh, Truman and uh, President Eisenhower. Yes, a special council of, of nothing but, you know, experts, you know, from every level. I mean, from the military to the defense contractors to the scientific community. And uh, amazingly, here is the FBI who got a hold of the MJ-12 documents, and they're turning them back over to the Defense Department saying, this is a leak, pal. This is not, you know, this is not some bogus, you know, manufactured, you know, set of documents, you know, by, by some, you know, like uh, mediocre source. I mean, you guys let the big, you know, like uh, secret slip. You know, and then the DOD, of course, you know, damage control. Oh, no, dude, you know, that's not our deal there. You know, that's just, a, you know, God only knows what kind of kook let that go, you know. But, well, you know, if, for something, you know, if you see the FBI's reaction to that particular document and turning it back over to the DOD, I mean, that's amazing. They sure have spent a hell of a lot of money and time studying something that's, theory, you know, supposedly to the cultural norm. Uh, a complete illusion and fantasy. I mean, that's where Bob Dean stepped into it in 1964 when he was stationed yes. uh, in, at European headquarters with the military and read the assessment by the um, Brookings Institute. What was, that, what, what was that organization? The Star, something Star Strategic uh, Initiative or something like that? I'm, I'm trying to remember how he put it. But basically, I mean, it was like a, you know, a, a a space, a special space defense program that was above and beyond strategic air command. I mean, it, you know, it was like uh, ultra was above cosmic level. Right. Yeah, above cosmic level or something like that. Uh, right. He 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 termed it as basically being way above uh, top secret. In other words, this was need right. to know at brass level. Mm -hmm. So in 1964, I, I think the Brookings report was done in 1962 or 1960. Uh, we already had two co congressional hearings on the matter at that point in history. That would have been 1958 through 1960, and then you have the Brookings report. They seem to be concerned with something. They're either investigating something that meant they needed outside advisors, a think tank plus their own top brass people in Majestic 12. Yeah, what was Battelle doing, you know, uh, a special investigation into UFOs in 1953 for, if, if there was nothing to do, uh, if there was nothing intelligible about all of this, you know, in uh, uh, correspondence to the Robertson panel, you right. know, that was done in 1953 to basically dismiss all the best cases of Project Blue Book, and then to basically take the teeth out of the tiger, make Project Blue Book a PR program, and send the most intelligent, significant reports to Wright-Patterson Air Base and basically bypass Project Blue Book from that point on. And this is exactly how government operates at every level, compartmentalization. So while right. one side is, is, is working diligently to pull together data, verify, collate, and assess, Another side is working on the debunking camp. This is actually, I think, Doc, how you install cognitive dissonance. You just create so much turbulence that, 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 that again, we're talking about consciousness. The consciousness wants to be comfortable. It has a norm. It wants to stay within it. So the turbulence basically forces the human mainstream consciousness to stay in that comfortable rut. Don't look here. Look forward. There's nothing going on, citizen. Keep walking. Right. And uh, I, and I, I think that's what all, pisses a lot of UFO investigators and researchers off is, is this constant churning of information. Uh, dismissal, denial, repudiation, secrecy. You know, typical tools of counterintelligence. Uh, do you recall Yuri Besmanov? Vaguely. Okay, Yuri was a defected U um, uh, KGB agent whose basic responsibility was disinformation. He was deployed by the Soviets, uh, you know, during the 60s and 70s to topple uh, countries that the Soviets, you know, deemed 
undesirable and and ripe, you know, for socialism. Uh, he defected um, because he saw how the Soviets basically hypocritically destroyed, you know, the the meaning of their own dialectic and how they, you know, liquidated, uh, you know, all of those advocates and and those uh, well, how should I say it, the useful idiots, you know, of the uh, of the uh, ideology. Okay. Right. So basically, he goes to Canada and defects. Then he comes to the United States and he begins a lecture tour in the mid '80s, and he is telling the U.S. I mean, he's telling people outright. He's going, you know, I didn't realize how far the U.S. had already been indoctrinated into socialism. And he said, my colleagues and I would have been proud of ourselves had we been able to do this with our own efforts. But you Americans don't realize what in the hell you're doing to yourself and your culture and your, you know, and your heritage and, and, you know, everything that draws the rest of the world to your free society. You are sleeping at the wheel and you are uh, allowing it to be compromised. And I'm so impressed by this man. You know, when you can go to YouTube and see his, uh, his presentations. And he talks about destabilization, demoralization, indoctrination. I mean, all of these, you know, goals that, that can be achieved internally to topple a strong nation where virtue and truth and family were once fundamentally important can all be destroyed with propaganda. And this is what is an element of UFO disinformation. It's the same damn thing being used against citizens that know better, against airline pilots that know better, against, you know, policemen that know better by what they've, you know, seen by military personnel on, on, you know, missile bases, you know, poised to launch nuclear deterrent strikes against the Soviet Union by these people that know what in the hell they saw and yet they're being intimidated they're being, uh, you know, ostracized, you know, they're being threatened, you know, with, uh, legal action. Uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking AFR dash 200, you know, one of, you know, one of, uh, a, a couple of, of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, damaging, you know, uh, uh, federal regulations, you know, that, that basically was trying to discourage, you know, air force bases from reporting events on their own premises. And yet the base commanders continue to do it. They continue to report the truth, regardless, you know, of, of the uh, uh, the threats, you know, by the federal government that they could be punished severely, you know, for just reporting the truth. I want to back up just a little bit in, in a kind of a chronological line and ask you, Doc, because I know you've done a lot of extensive research in this. Your take on what is called the Greta Treaty uh, which was probably prior to Eisenhower, probably in the Truman uh, post World War II uh, presidency. But the Greta Treaty is long been rumored to have been a series of uh, agreements made with extraterrestrials, which was technology in exchange for human subjects, hence the uh, modern day phenomenon of ET abductions. Uh, according to the chronological now, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that I know exactly, you know, the, I can't read into, you know, to the mindset of history, but I believe that according to James McElroy's testimony, uh, former Eisenhower, uh, ambassador and legislator for, you know, uh, uh, one of the States, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, New Hampshire. Okay who just prior to retiring acknowledged that Eisenhower had been forced to negotiate, you know, with aliens. Okay. And Eisenhower, unfortunately, because we had a technical deficit between us and the aliens that we were negotiating with had to negotiate, you know, in less than, than the best possible terms for us. In other words, um, he was forced to, if we were going to accept technology that if it was offered to the Russians, they would, 
they would have taken it no matter what kind of costs you know, to the human condition. But Eisenhower basically, uh, I think, tried to negotiate in the best interests of the American people that he could. But still, this allowed for a certain amount of abductions, a certain amount of uh, uh, biological experimentation, uh, a certain amount of, uh, well, let's put it this way, cattle mutilation. Uh, and what was asked in return was that if it was um, the abduction of human beings, that they would be returned to their original place where they were abducted from. The cattle mutilations, now there's a lot of can't controversy about that, and Linda Moulton Howe will tell you about it, but in chief faced, I mean, a lot of threats from the feds where, I mean, somebody even held a gun to her face and basically said, look, you know, if I wanted to take you out right now, I could, and there would be no questions asked, you know. Uh, Eisenhower was forced to negotiate in, in less than a positive, you know, position, but in order to keep from the Soviets from being able to get technology that would have really, I mean, broken, you know, the detente, you know, and, and the equalization, you know, during the Cold War period, uh, he was forced to take the deal that he had to take. Um, now, I know of a situation that goes all the way back to 1938, um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the Secretary, Secretary of State at that time, where there was a witness that claimed that... Um, he was taken down to the bottom of the warehouse where there was a huge underground exhibit area and that there was crash debris there and a huge glass fluid enclosure that had alien bodies in it. I'm trying to think of his name. And he's prior That would have been to, James Forrestal. Okay, well, Forrestal was during the World War II era. Okay. This is the guy before him, and I'm trying to think of what his name is. He was in Truman administration. Forrestal uh, was the guy. Forrestal I, was. Yeah. Forrestal was, yes. yes. Yes, he was. Okay. But anyway, okay. Um, so, you know, there's going to be rumors, and there's going to be, you know, like half evidence, and there's going to be, um, you know, allegations you know, that are always going to lead us to, you know, maybe even further relevant revelations that, that we're not necessarily aware of right now as more information, uh, you know, gets disseminated. Uh, but I would say that, um, yes, I mean, we're talking about there was a lot of information divulged, you know, between the late 30s, the 1940s, and the, and the 50s that, I don't think has been either fully appreciated, fully analyzed, or has been dismissed and covered up and filtered. Right, and and time favors the the cover up. The longer this stuff exactly. is left lying, um, it becomes. The longer it goes, the you know the less likely it is for us to derive the the truth from it. Yeah, and that's why it's important. That, that people like you and myself and Chris Holly and all the other people, the folks over at UFO Digest, it's important we keep pushing this information out because I refuse to cede the history, the deniability of what happened, especially since um, the end of the Second World War, the security state that, that began in 1947, it coincidentally, you know, right around the time of Roswell, and going into the 1950s because I think this is an important period that led up to where we are now and it's still not real well understood do you want to hear something really horrific that I found out from being with the Tea Party and uh, being around a man whose father was hired as a contractor by the Defense Department this happened during the you know and, and I mean nobody makes a better point than Norio about the emergence of the security state from about 1947 on and why all of a sudden there was such an important push to classify information and to extend the classification of information into a huge, you know, uh, security funnel, you know, that would eclipse the rights 
of the witness and the federal employee and the military, you know, forces, and it just spread from there. And then there were the um, the equivalent of of what Obama did in you know uh, you know when he passed when he passed the uh, NDAA legislation here over the last couple of years, but it, during the Truman administration was the beginning, you know, the prelude, you know, to codifying the security state in terms of federal law. Which, by the way, is completely unconstitutional. There's no, pre- yes. there's no premise at all in any of our founding documents, if you believe in that. Our founding fathers were brilliant. They knew that you don't want a, a centralized federal government telling the states what to do. They, they knew exactly what they were doing. But the installation... Oh, of the God, Supreme- I wish those men were in power today. I mean, we would have such a different culture. No, they would have no chance in being in power today. They would either be assassinated or discredited. They would they would be kennedy or Perot, depending on how, how you view all of that. But Well, you know, you could say that, but you know what? I think of George Washington, a brilliant horseman and swordsman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> riding his horse through Congress, you know, lopping off heads. <laughs> and unfortunately, I hear again, you know, the, the suppressors of history win because we're so short memoried now that we don't remember the time before World War II. I mean, I had long. Well, conversa- what? I mean, you got the public schools that I mean, the, the yeah, government right. public schools that they don't want to teach history. They don't want to teach the, you know, the U.S. Constitution. So you, you evaporate that from the consciousness of the child, and he no longer knows what the great heritage and exceptionalism of this country is anymore. He has no concept. But even looking at the construction of the National Security Act, it was never intended to be applied to the citizens at large. I mean, here's where, you know, we could do shows on this, the construction of law and what it means. Right. This was perceived by the American public as strictly being part of the military culture that was growing, what Eisenhower warned us later, the military-industrial complex. But the security state has so vastly expanded now that while it took 9-11 to bring it in, we eventually got to Homeland Security, which is the ultimate representative of this repugnant, ugly monster that sits over top of America now. Well, you know, we uh, we are actually suffocating under the weight of big government <clears throat> that thinks that it knows better than we do what reality is and what our rights are and how we should behave, and that it is protecting those who don't deserve protection, and it's victimizing those who support society with the strength of their character. You know, and and so, you know, we are in the, gosh, I don't know what, you know, what stage we're in right now, (laughs) Uh, but I think we're in a stage of... Uh, of In terms of cancer, it's like stage seven. I mean, the victim is basically, (laughs) you know, at this point, the only thing that works is drugs. Just keep them medicated. And that's exactly... I mean, the malignancy is so far spread. You're, you're, You're exactly right. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh, the narcotics now are, are, are cell phones and Facebook and Twitter. And look, I, I'm not a Luddite. I have lots of computers and I'm pretty tacky. But I see oh, the and video games and, and reality shows, too. Yeah. Okay? Which aren't reality at all. They're fantasy no. with, you know, really bad actors. Concocted, concocted you know, with, with very superficial individuals. Yeah, it's, it's, this is, but this is the culture we live in now. It's the morphine for the masses so that they don't look up and see the UFO in the sky, that they don't see the chemtrails over their cities, that they don't see the cancer that's invaded their organism. It's, they don't see the evaporation of their, of their constitutional rights. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The God given um, rights. A, uh, okay, go ahead. No, I was going to say they're God-given rights, because above and beyond the Constitution or any other document, the Founding Fathers recognized that those rights were God-given rights, that man actually being a divine creature was himself endowed with these things. This was inalienable rights, inalienable rights, our inherent divine nature. 
and we've lost all that. You know, you talk about the evaporation of the culture, and and part of that has to do with the fact that spirituality has been so distilled that people don't understand anymore what their true nature is. If they did, they'd stand up and they would take their their rights back. Well, you know, uh, Randy, for UFO Digest here in Easter, I uh, wrote. Yes, I saw this. How, I was going to ask you about this, so go ahead. Let's talk about it. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, and I mean, how you know Jesus Christ? I mean, had such incredible, I mean, powers uh, that they were paranormal, but they weren't just paranormal. He sacrificed himself, even though he possessed these incredible powers of healing and of feeding the masses of being able to, uh, you know, uh, allow the blind to see, he easily could have negotiated, negotiated his way out of this crucifixion. He could have negotiated his way into being the ruler of the region that Pontius Pilate, you know, uh, possessed, you know, with, with his ability, you know, uh, to, to, you know, perform miracles, you know, thanks to the, his God-given power, and yet he allowed himself, you know, to be murdered, you know, at the cross. Um, you know, at the behest of his own father. And um, it just stands as an incredible testament, you know, to the spiritual existence, you know, that is there for all of us if we just open our eyes and, and you know, and, and we we live in that purity. But, you know, the ways of the world, they're, they're corrupting. Well, I think you and I'd probably agree too, Doc, that there's a spiritual dimension to everything we've talked about for this last hour so far and yes it has to do with the fact that even ufology itself has these weird paranormal overlays um it's good and it's bad it's part of the duality right. of the universe as well i mean my personal experience is there's bad ones and there's good ones and you really want to stay away from the bad ones but you got to understand that i think we have allies in the universe as well Yin and yang, you know, as the Chinese put it, you know, the positive and the negative forces of the universe. And, and so, you know, for me, this has always been a spiritual quest. I mean, Off-Planet Radio has basically always featured itself as being a show about spirituality, as well as the paranormal and UFOs. And there's a reason for that, because I basically worked in um, Christian radio for seven years before I did this show. And when I did this show, I sacrificed that audience. Um, right. They 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 couldn't make yeah, a lot of you know there are uh, people that you know they can't deal with it they they they, they don't want to look at Ezekiel and oh. you know and disciples that, that saw things that you know that were of a UFO related nature they don't want to deal with that they don't want to deal with the six hundred pound elephant in the room which is you know yeah. again going back to the the um, Fortean quote I believe that mankind is but property. Um, yes. The idea that I like that how you keep referring back to that because it is I, I I inherently believe that we are we're definitely not the captains you know uh, of our of our course well, we're certainly you know, not right now no. somebody else that's yanking our chain you know and and we should be, be being able to identify that but we're not you know because we're being deceived consistently yes and see here's the deal if they could actually you know on one level. I believe humanity was conquered tens of thousands of years ago. I believe that humanity was engineered. But I'm only talking now about bodies and what you would call biological evolution. I'm not talking right. about the core of not our spirit. Right. So, theoretically, you've got incredible beings who, uh, you know, who knows, 400,000 years ago had better technology than we still have today. And yet, somehow... We're walking around, we're semi-conscious, we're kind of drooling, we're waking up a little bit. Some of us are getting it. Still dragging our knuckles. Exactly. But you and I are having a conversation here about what is frankly some very deep stuff, which indicates to me that we are not conquered and that whatever it is, it is out there hasn't been able to suppress the spirit of humanity. Which I think is well, you know, Randy. For people like you and I, and and the gifted few, and and those of us that have risen above the indoctrination, yes, that's true. Uh, what I worry about, and and I, I anguish over, is the mass majority. You know that are locked into a, unfortunately, a battle of consciousness for 
food, groceries, a roof over their head, um, you know, a six pack of beer, a ball game and a reality show, you know, and that's as far as their consciousness takes them, you know, and that's the tragic part. Because I had a conversation this afternoon with a, a, another talk show host out in Los Angeles. And, you know, we go through these periods of time where we wring our hands over the course of humanity and we go, man, they're not getting it. They're, they're really clueless. And then it's like, yeah, but, you know, at any given time, if you look back at American history, it was a very small percentage of people in the history of the, the colonies that actually went forward and, and, and fought the revolutionary war. You know, you know, I think back to Concord. When, I mean, nothing but just regular farmers took up arms against trained British troops, the best troops in the world. Yeah, yeah. And they not only stopped them, they turned them back and set them on a 20-mile retreat and then ambushed them all the way back. You know, I mean, to me, that is just such a, you know, uh, an inspiring uh, and, and courageous statement about people that were willing to die, you know, for the, the, the good of freedom, for the, you know, I mean, you know, a, a sense of righteousness that we just don't see among most people today, you know. Yeah, what I call the fire in the belly. Uh, yes. But we're not conquered. And as I was telling my friend, you know, I, I, I think at one time, three to five percent of the population turned events in the world. That seems to be historical numbers, but we also have this this consciousness shift that's going on, and I've talked about this for ten years, and I'm saying now, you know, one, two, three percent, we can push this thing, we can push humanity forward. We just have to keep. It has to be done. It has to be it done. It does, and 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 I think it's important that we not lose sight of that goal because, hey, you know, I'll tell you, dude, at the beginning of this year, I was sick, I was disgusted, and I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if this is worth it. Oh, man, Randy, don't give up, dude. But, well, the reason why I think we do what we do is because there's a bigger picture in front of us, and that's when we finally do turn the corner. As I said, a lot of my listeners from seven or eight years ago couldn't make the hairpin turn. They were religious, they weren't spiritual, and they were fixated on on dogma that has not served mankind well. Right, but, you know, the, the superficial surface, you know, of, of the big picture just, you know, they're, they're caught on the surface, but they're not absorbing the big picture. They're not seeing, you know, everything ultimately that is going on. Uh, the epiphany has not reached them. But you, know, but you know what, I'll tell you, I've been going through the same thing uh, for the last few months due to my uh, divorce. And, um, you know, I've questioned many things about, you know, who I am, what I did, you know, uh, what my inadequacies were, uh, where I failed, where I triumphed. And ultimately, it brings me back to the very point that you and I are talking about, Randy, that... You know, you and I and everybody that's enlightened, you know, that wants better for everybody on the face of this earth, but we're unwilling to give in, you know, to the negative forces of global government, of suppression, of, you know, the CFR and, the you know, and the trilaterals and, you know, and every negative force that, that collectivism, you know, wants to impose upon the masses because it's not right. Every one of us has a God-given right to pursue our happiness as long as we don't hurt anyone else. That's right. And if to pursue Chinese, our truth. Um, yes, exactly. And and to the end of pursuing that truth, we had on the plate tonight two topics. We've really gone through uh, <laughs> mankind, <laughs> really mankind is but property pretty thoroughly at this point. But I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, back a couple weeks ago, I did um, a show with Chris Holly. Sometimes we just get together and we just yak about whatever's on our minds. And um, Chris was discussing a um, uh, a chemtrail spewing aerosoling uh, plane over Long Island that she viewed with her husband, which uh, mm -hmm. by the time they attempted to get a camera to photograph it, had uh, apparently gone stealth on them very suddenly. Really? And uh, yeah, that's uh, that. That was an interesting story. You're, you're saying it had shut off the nozzle or had basically it, just plane, disappeared? The plane disappeared. 
Wow. In front of them. Uh, Chris, Chris's husband, who is, as I've described him, definitely not a woo-woo guy at all, was profoundly disturbed by what he saw, and he is also ex-military. So when you dangle this other topic in front of me about UFO stealth technology, um, I wanted to talk about that. So that's kind of yeah, where I'd like to leave that. this interview. This is uh, UFO Digest. You posted this two weeks and one day ago as of this date, and it's UFO stealth technology demonstration circa 1952. Right. Let's get into the 1948 uh, Nova uh, exposed uh, uh, documentary uh, okay. that came out back in the mid '80s. Um, there was a P-51 uh, Mustang pilot who was on um, in in an undisclosed, you know, uh, area who was on routine patrol, and uh, of course, you know, these guys are trying to observe and to pursue and investigate or intercept. You know, anything unusual because it, it you know, it, it basically represents a threat, you know, to our airspace. So this guy at about the height of somewhere just below 30,000 feet had seen a contrail. And a contrail basically is, uh, you know, the ice crystals generated by the exhaust of a conventional you know, piston driven or, or, you know, jet or rocket, you know, fuel form of propulsion. And, uh, they're basically, you know, well identified. There's, you know, no problem with, you know, uh, seeing that this is generated by a aircraft of some type. Okay. So they're at 30,000 feet. I believe the operating, uh, ceiling of a P-51 Mustang, the, his particular P-51D was about 41,900 feet. So he begins to engage uh, this aircraft. Surprisingly, as, as he pursues, he notices that there's a contrail, you know, and but there's no aircraft, you know, uh, at the head of the contrail. This, the contrail keeps spewing, you know, exhaust at him, but there's no vehicle, you know, visible. So, you know, he's calling his superiors, telling them, you know, hey, you know, I've got something here, you know, that's generating an exhaust trail, but there's no object, you know, that I can see visually. And they said, go ahead and use your gun camera footage, you know, footage. So basically he had to pull his aircraft up into a steep uh, climb and in doing so also activated his wing to wing uh, combat cameras or, or uh, you know, gun cameras as they call them. And he took several feet of footage of this enigmatic generation of, you know, uh, exhaust freezing, you know, and, and you know, 30,000, 40,000, you know, feet of, uh, of air. And yet with no flying machine generating it. Okay. So how can one come to any other conclusion other than there was a vehicle there? that was using some form of, you know, semi-conventional propulsion. And you can't hide the, the, the source or the, or the side effect of the propulsion. You might be able to hide the solid object itself. But when it's being propelled by a scramjet or a ramjet or, or a pulse jet or a turbine engine or a piston engine, it's going to generate exhaust. Right. And no matter how stealthy you are, you can't hide the exhaust. So my allegation, my purported interpretation of this engagement is, is that pilot was looking, you know, at the end result of a stealth aircraft that was propelling itself through our atmosphere. And it was cloaked, but it could not cloak you know, the, the contrail, you know, that was coming from the propulsion system. Now, if it had been electromagnet, uh, electromagnetic as the CIA is as, as early as 1952 had speculated, um, as majestic 12, you know, had, had, uh, touched upon, you know, that, uh, if you have a magnetically charged vehicle that is using super cooled circuits, that is able to generate a powerful enough electromagnetic field 
that can actually repel itself from, you know, the, the gravity of the earth, then basically it's not a, a conventional aircraft in terms of it's not generating propulsion. It is actually just floating in a electromagnetic flux right. between the gravitational pull, which is, you know, the earth is very electrical. You know, the, um, the astronauts found out that, you know, when they extended uh, in orbit, uh, with the shuttle, a uh, basically what was a a lightning rod in the rear of the ship, that there was so much electricity that was hitting it that they could shut down their electrical systems and run off of the electricity being generated by that shaft that was attracting all this, you know, el- electrical you know activity mm-hmm. in orbit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, say Roswell, for instance, you know, and and, uh, even in in, uh, Majestic 12, you know, as uh, Majestic, which was written by um, Whitley Stryber and then Communion, you know, later on in Communion 2 or 3 or whatever, but that if you had a technology where somebody could generate, you know, a strong enough electromagnetic field, they could literally float across, you know, the gravitational pull of a planet, you know, and not really have to propel themselves at all, but literally just float and levitate across it. And then by deviating, you know, the direction, you know, of that pulse or of that flux, they could travel thousands of miles an hour, you know, with little atmospheric uh, or or little, you know, um, engineering resistance, you know, to their right, craft. Exactly. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they're so little, you know, that, that they need to use in order to propel themselves. They don't need to use a huge, you know, like a gas burning or, or, you know, a ignition system, you know, or, or, you know what I'm saying? They, they don't well, use, and, need to use a, a gigantic this, yeah. mechanical system. They just have an, a, an electrical generator, you know, that is, that is, projecting downward and just like two magnets that repel each other when you hit it there too when you said flux field i i think exactly uh anybody anybody who's had any encounters with ufos and this is not anecdotal it's historical and it's documented knows that there's a strong electrical field that will usually put out car engines and people who have been up close documented by project blue book in several cases exactly know that this field is present anytime there's a there's a contact or abduction uh event takes place it's inevitably reported i mean cars you know cars that you know like like you know the 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 radios the engines you know snap out people's hair stands on end uh there's even electrical you know uh uh, phenomenon going on in the atmosphere it's incredible which which goes to this whole idea that we're dealing with engines here and I'll just use that as a convenient term of reference, but something that is being powered more in accord more in accord with the natures of an electrical universe, an electrical right. solar system, galaxy, and universe. Do you remember Ray Bradbury? Uh, Absolutely. I sing. I sing the body, body electric. electric. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up reading Ray Bradbury. Oh, he was brilliant. <laughs> that was the golden age of sci-fi, dude. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, it was also spiritual because Brad, Bradbury said that he could sit at his, his typewriter and he, stream of consciousness, could just begin typing and a, and a story would just take fold, you know? Yeah. And, be, you know, tapping in, you know, to the, to the you know, to the super consciousness, you know, I, I believe people like him just tap oh, into he was a like high, Mozart. realm he was, of consciousness, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, he's like a great composer. That's, no, that's it's, it's not even fiction, you know. It, it, it's like he's visionary and he's just looking into the future and he's talking about a particular scenario. Yeah. Bradbury, you know? Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, these were guys yes. that, the, that were really the giants of sci-fi because what they were doing was, I consider them all to be prophets in a certain sort of weird yes. way. Definitely, because they're integrating the, you know, they're they're integrating physics and modern science into a realm of prediction, 
in a realm of uh, human mortality, in a realm of of morality. You know, and they're talking about ethics. They're saying, you know, where does all of the, of this take us? And what responsibility as human beings do we have in our civil rights, you know, and, and, and uh, how as individuals, you know, does the influence of science and technology, you know, uh, actually, you know, have an impact upon us? And, and where does this all flow into a society that is eventually going to be governed as a result of the impact of you know of all of this technology i mean you know they predicted the internet long before the internet ever happened yes exactly um you can go back to um to your du chardin who predicted the new sphere and even emmanuel velikovsky hinted yes. at uh at what we now call the internet as well because what they were really seeing was a connection of human consciousness which yes. is greater than the physicality of the internet itself right yeah, because of the, you know, the implications, you know, the, the you know, upon an entire world. Uh, it, it's just not about communicating or playing games or, or media, you know, uh, social media. It, it's so much more than that. It's a connecting of human consciousness on an instantaneous level that cannot necessarily be oppressed by governments. You know, and totalitarianists and collectivists and statists and social socialists, you know, in other words, you know, that that people can connect and, and, and communicate with each other and express things to each other, you know, on, on levels that were never attainable before. Well, I've argued for a long time because I've had conversations with some of my tech friends about, you know, what happens if they decide to pull the switch on the Internet. And I went, there is no Internet. Because if you look at what the internet is, it's a network of networks. It was originally designed by uh, DARPA. The Defense Department. The, it was de designed by DARPA to survive yeah. a nuclear attack. It, it's completely non-local. In fact, it's very quantum in the way it works because routers well, it, can... It started, it, it started as a limited network Sure. Yeah. between all the universities to funnel uh, strategic data to the Defense Department. Right. Because they wanted all the gifted minds and all the scientists and all the researchers to be able to funnel this essential and crucial information directly and, you know, to control, you know, disseminate it, manage it, you know, and use it. But guess what? It got out of control and the masses got a hold of it. They, I've always said, Doc, I, I don't think they, in, this was unintended consequences. I don't think they intended to give the public the internet. I think what happened no. was it was it was the idea whose time had come, and that was the vessel through which it flowed. Right. You know, I remember Rod Stewart saying that as early as 1983, that when he was recording an album, they were already exchanging over the internet ideas, musical ideas between the studio and and where he was recording his music. And where it was going, you know, ultimately to be master taped. Yeah, yeah. And I remember... You know, 1983, I mean, Jesus, man, that's really ahead I of, remember... You know, uh, reading, really ahead of the curve. Reading about Stevie Wonder, who was basically sending um, MIDI tracks back and forth via email with musicians he was collaborating with. And mm -hmm. this, was, this mm -hmm. was before what we call the Internet now. So, right. you know, again... Technology is an expression of human consciousness, and, and to yes. assign it uh, a dark figure by saying, well, the military gave it to us. No, they didn't give it to us. First off, we finance these people. Uh, yes. We are the American people. That's a good point, Randy. That's a very, very good point. The American people finance this research. It would be criminal to not turn it over to us, just as it is criminal now to not turn over the existence of cold fusion and other free energy forms that the military is already using. And, you know. Yeah, much less Benghazi, the, you know, the NSA, the IRS, oh, you know, yeah. all the other. 
I mean, all, you know, all the other clear violations of the federal government over the rights of the people, you know. But you see, right now, they can't control that either. The tide can't be stemmed. We just continue to have disclosures and blow ups and people who are exposing what's going on. And it's getting more and more difficult to contain all of this because of the infrastructure that enables us to be. And of course, they want to have a kill button for the Internet. Of course, they want to have that. But I, I know better and, and anybody that's a, an engineer knows that there's no single kill button to do that because there are enough people out there who understand how routers work and there are in fact hackers out there who are standing by prepared to combine wi-fi routers in a way that would create ad hoc internets in fact in parts of eastern europe they've they've even using done. cell phones even using cell networks absolutely and so you know the idea that you can kill this beast and turn turn off the light is, is absurd now it's already out of the bag the, what we have to do is we have to use it as a serious form of communication and not get caught up in the frivolous bullshit that goes on on social media networks. I mean, I'm disgusted by that, but I also see the value in having it there as well. I look at something like right. UFO I mean, Digest, yes, this, and I'm in you know, awe. This instantaneous uh, exchange of, uh, of thoughts and concepts is what is so essential. Um, I feel myself so much closer now to other cultures like China and Europe because you're starting to find out that these people as well know what they know what oppression is and they want to rise above it and they realize the importance, you know, and the truth. So, you know, it's not just America, you know, that's reaching out, you know, and, and being the only beacon of freedom in the world because we're under attack by our own, by our own government. But as well, we see other cultures that are struggling, you know, uh, for the same truth. Uh, they want rights, you know, they want the, the freedom of, uh, the individual to conceive what is best for them and to have the choice to do it and for that choice not to be dictated by government. Of all of that is that our brothers and sisters on the other side of the globe see the darkness in America in a way that I think maybe we're only beginning to wake up and see ourselves. Look, I am a patriot. I love the country, but I'm not a blind patriot. I see it for what it is, and I see right. how the greatness has been obliterated by the dark beasts that run this place right now. And right. that's that's the beauty of being able to do what we do right now, is that we have ability to basically take our, our light out from underneath the bushels and stick it up in the air together and begin to make some movements to liberate the, the consciousness of this planet. You know, not to allow the original dream of our forefathers, which was brilliant, and it was um, spiritual. Yes. And and it was philosophically um, liberating. Uh, for the first time in human history, that you know that uh, feudal systems did not interfere, or kings or monarchs or dictators did not interfere with the freedom of the people. And that should be the ultimate burning torch, you know, that says forever that we will not be oppressed. Perfectly said, my friend. I think that I think that's actually a great place to put the period at the end of this long sentence you and I have woven over the last two hours. Doc Vega, it's been great talking to you. Uh, tell people about your website and also your writing over at UFO Digest. Uh, I, um, despite my, you know, personal travail that I'm going through right now, I'm still contributing to, uh, ufodigest.com. I write at Politicite. Uh, I'm a conservative, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tea Party oriented, you know, individual, you know, that believes in the freedom that was granted to us by our forefathers in the, in the U.S. Constitution. And I still believe in this country, despite what the government's doing to it. And I just hope that my fellow Americans in my country, I'll be there along with you when you do. Amen, brother. That's going to wrap it up for this time. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. We'll be back with another show very soon.
can't be 